Welcome everyone to this exciting webinar brought to you by the team at Public Sector Executive in conjunction with Ubitricity. We'll be delving into EV charging, infrastructure and where the public sector's place lies in the conversation. I'm Matt Roberts, I'm the editor here at Public Sector Executive and I'll be serving as the host for today's conversations, keeping everything flowing. While I'm sure I could have a good crack at it myself, thankfully for all the rest of you, I'm joined today by a brilliant group of guests with far richer expertise than myself on this subject. We'll bring them into the conversation shortly, but today I have Adam Jones, Sales Manager at Ubertricity, Aaron Berry, Deputy Head of the Office for Zero Emissions Vehicles, part of the Japan Department of Transport. You might hear me call them OZE throughout. Jill Noel, uh, Head of EV LV Insurance, and Councillor James Spencer, Cabinet Member for City Management and responsible for EV work at Westminster City Council. But before I pick the brains of my esteemed guests, let me set the scene for you first and explain some of the great functionality we have on offer today to ensure that you, our audience, get the opportunity to contribute to the conversation too. Uh, you can do this by using the live Q&A tools, which will be located on the right-hand side of your screen. Pop a question in there and it will come straight through to myself, ready to put to our guests. As mentioned, today's conversations are all about the relationship between the public sector and EV. There's no shift, there's a shift to, to electric vehicles, if the words can come out and have, uh, is a big part of many local authorities' net zero strategies. And where there are electric vehicles, we must have electrical vehicle charging capacity. For those with on off street parking and the opportunity to install home charging, that's great. But what about those people who don't have that capacity? As many as 40 to 60 percent of residents I was reading in urban cities earlier today fall into this category, and we can't allow them to be cut off from the EV revolution because of a lack of sustainable or suitable charging infrastructure. That's where our councils can come in. We, as a public sector, can be that jigsaw piece. Of, and it will be complex at times. There will be challenges. But today's conversations are all about touching on those myths, those barriers, and looking at the ways that we can bring effective EV charging into place. Don't worry, you won't have to refinance the whole council budget just to do EV charging. As mentioned earlier, our webinar today is brought to you in association with Ubertricity. I want to bring them into the conversation approach and their approach to EV on street charging as well, and in particular take advantage of existing infrastructure and standing as a sporting expert partner. But I think we can all agree that you've heard my voice for a little bit too much so far. Um, so let me bring the real experts in the conversation, the people you're actually here to listen to. So Adam, Aaron, Jill and James, welcome to our virtual stage. And Adam, once we've got you on here, if you don't mind, I want to come to yourself first. It's a bit of a big question, so I don't necessarily expect you to run with the whole answer. It's the whole point of today's discussions. But in a nutshell, why should EV charging matter to the public sector? Yeah, thanks, Matt. And uh, I guess good morning to everybody. It's good to see so many people on the webinar. Um, I guess it's important, first of all, to understand why the EV even exists. What is the need for it? Um, you know, I think if we look at the current, you know, if you switch on the news in the last few days, you know, or the last few weeks, you start to see the current sort of climate agenda. Over the last two or three years, councils have announced climate emergency. You know, and I think if we look at the bigger picture and the worst culprit or the worst offender, you know, the transport sector is the highest emitting sector in the UK. You know, 27% of all emissions come from the transport sector. Um, and it hasn't really done anything in the last 30 years, by which I mean reducing those emissions. You know, we've seen 3% reduction in three decades. You know, it's really not good enough. And then delving a little bit deeper into that, you know, the makeup of the transport sector, 61% of emissions come from cars. You know, so while it's only a piece of the puzzle, you know, modal shift targets from councils. So getting them, you know, away from a car onto public transport, walking, cycling, lift sharing is vitally important. I think there is a reliance on technology and the electrification of vehicles to play a big part in the councils hitting their net zero targets, driving those emissions down. Um, you know, it plays a big part in the climate agenda as a whole. And I think we're seeing a real adoption of EVs recently, you know, but it's clear to see that for the majority of parts across the UK, the charging infrastructure just isn't there. And I think in order for EV to be successful, there is a real reliance on adequate charging infrastructure across the UK. Um, we're seeing the private sector, as you'd expect, do its own thing. You know, I'm sure you've seen these charge points pop up and down the UK in, in supermarkets and service stations. I don't think that's an invitation for the public sector and local authorities and councils just to sit on their hands and wait for the private sector to do its thing. You know, and I think that's evident when you look at where the majority of charging takes place. 
you know, over 80% of charging takes place at home, which as you've already said, Matt, is fantastic if I'm in a fortunate position to have a driveway, you know, to be able to stick one of these awesome electric vehicle charge points on the side of my house, you know, and unless I'm, you know, doing a long journey and having to do on route or destination charging, I don't have to worry about that. But as you've said, there's a UK average of 40% of people that don't have that luxury, don't have access to off-street parking. So I think this is where councils and local authorities have to come into the picture. They have to be working, you know, alongside and supporting these residents to afford them as close to that luxury as possible as the people that have off-street parking do. You know, you need to make it, um, you know, really, um, I guess, accessible, you know, really cost-effective, really easy to use. And by cost effective, I don't just mean in terms of, you know, charging costs. Obviously, we all know, you know, compare home charging to going to a rapid hub, there is a disparity in costs there. But in terms of, you know, time spent, you know, I don't really, you know, in my head want to be going to spend 40 minutes, you know, once a week at a rapid charging hub. And that's if there's space there. You know, Jill put a brilliant post on a couple of days ago of a Tesco car park and all the EV charging points were full, you know. So, it's, if you get there and that's the case, you've got to wait for that turnover. And I just think, you know, there is a better way, I guess, a, a more realistic solution to enabling people that have to park on streets because they live in terrace houses or flats. You know, the ability to to be able to charge their cars as easily, as efficiently as possible. And as you've said, we can't leave these guys behind. You know, it's 40 percent of people that, you know, are struggling to transition because that barrier is there. You know, and I think we need to scoop these up, drive those emissions down. Um, I think electric vehicles plays a big part of that. Absolutely. And as you say, there's a role in there for local authorities and the councils. And we're going to move on to that in today. But first, I want to actually bring an opportunity for our audience to let us know where they're on in that current journey. So what you, if I can direct the audience's attention to the, uh, the side of the screen, they will see an option of a live poll um, come up. Uh, we're keen to hear your inputs on your EV journeys, where you're at on your current path to net zero as we go into these conversations today. So I believe that will now be open for us to begin voting and we'll give a minute or so to let that come in, just as we uh, we get ready to delve into the real meat of the conversation. Uh, Aaron, I'll be coming to yourself after we do that. Brilliant. And it's great to see already a number of our audience members adding to that vote. Um, it seems that uh, very much it, a lot of them are either planned or starting early on in the installation. But it's great to see a mix there as well. And um, I guess as we, uh, we sort of start to uh, see these, and we'll bring the results on after we ask this question, Aaron, um, what does uh, yourself and Ozev, where do you see the uh, the role for local authorities being in this uh, delivery of EV vehicle infrastructure? Yeah, thank thank you, Adam, and uh, yeah, hello hello everyone. It's, it's fascinating to see the, the live poll as as we're chatting through this, and we're, we're currently at around a third of uh, of local authorities have, have no installations planned yet or are currently planning them. So quite a high proportion, and I think we're seeing that in the statistics. So what one of the key things we have today is, is quite a patchy rollout of uh, of on street charging infrastructure across across the country. So in areas like the southeast and London uh, and, and, and very patchy in certain areas elsewhere and that's a, a concern concern for residents a concern for ministers and it's uh, one of uh, one of our roles in OZEV to, to try and ensure that we have a strong network right right across the country so to, to answer your question more directly um, well, what do we see as the role for for local authorities in on-street delivery well I mean they're, they're fundamental aren't they I mean to, to successful on-street delivery at the end of the day, they're responsible for the local highways. So you can't really uh, deliver on street charging infrastructure without the involvement of local authorities. And of course, you, you wouldn't want to either. Local authorities are the best place to understand the needs of uh, of their residents. So I suppose we could maybe break it down into, into three areas where, where local authorities have a, a really important role. First instance, uh, developing strategies for their local residents. So um yeah uh, local authorities are best place to understand the needs uh, of their local residents and they need best understand the needs of, of how local ev charging infrastructure fits with their wider 
uh, transport and energy plans. So, you know, local authorities are responsible for uh, developing uh, local transport plans for helping to to uh, support net zero, as Adam was saying previously. So EVs are an important part of that. Uh, secondly, there's a, a coordination role for local authorities. So engaging and liaising with key stakeholders uh, for both the development and delivery of EV charging infrastructure. Uh, that's sort of coordinating with different tiers uh, of local authorities, for example, combined authorities, the highways authorities, uh, district councils, etc. So making sure that, that we're sort of joined up in terms of uh, deployment plans, but also working with local businesses to understand um, the needs of local businesses. Uh, and then charge point operators, there, there may be existing plans for charge point rollout in certain areas of, of rapid hubs, etc. of the sort of um, installations that, that we're seeing in the supermarkets and, uh, and, the, and the various retailers. So understanding the sort of picture uh, of charge point rollout in their area is also really important. And last but by no means least, uh, delivery. Uh, local authorities need to be involved in the delivery of on-street charging infrastructure. So dealing with putting those strategies uh, into action, uh, procuring and managing the contracts with charge point operators. There are lots of different options for charge point deployment um, and securing funding is, is one of the areas that I know we'll, uh, we'll come on to in, in due course, Matt. But yeah, it's, it's a really, really exciting area. The bottom line, we, we won't get it without the close involvement of local authorities. Absolutely. And James, if I can bring yourself into the conversation, we saw from the poll results, which thank you to our audience for putting that uh, those results in there. Um, there's it's actually quite a small number of respondent councils have involved, um, already have established a charge point infrastructure. But I know for yourselves in Westminster, that is something that you're already making good strides with. Could you tell us a little bit about the situation there and also what your plans going forward are? Absolutely. Thanks, Matt. One of the challenges we face in Westminster, um, and it comes with being the capital of the capital, is that people want to come here. People want to come here to work, they want to come here to see our fantastic cultural offer, and they want to come here to see our, our historic sites. And so we do have a problem with air quality. Um, I think we're one of the worst uh, boroughs in the country for air quality, and which is why in 2019 we declared a climate emergency and put air quality at the heart of everything we do. And that uh, goes from everything from our planning policy to our social housing policy, but primarily um, our transport policy. And so we kicked off probably the largest expansion or the largest rollout of electric vehicle charging um, points uh, anywhere in the capital, most likely anywhere um, in the country. Um, and we're in a situation now where we're, we are closing down on 1500 um, EV charging points across the entire city. And that's a mixture of the trickle charges linked into our lampposts or freestanding uh, charging points um, and uh, rapid charges. Uh, and one of the things we're looking at now is how we can use some of our other council owned land, and particularly our council owned car parks, to expand our rapid charging network and, and facilities. Um, we've taken very much a, a, an understanding that we want to create an infrastructure that encourages people to convert um, to electric vehicles because it's the, the, the understanding, the knowledge that people still need to use a car uh, in central London. Um, and we want to make the conversion uh, as easy as possible. And the next challenges for us is that we, we've, we've converted a large chunk of the city, which we call the low hanging fruit, where, where the infrastructure is relatively easy um, to, to convert. The next challenge is looking at our more difficult areas, I think. In Westminster, you only have to start digging down three feet before you hit something historical or Victorian or even Roman. So part of the challenge is how do we then put that infrastructure in some of our more historic areas and more complex areas um, that we can uh, continue this successful rollout? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think one of my next questions was actually going to uh, be towards uh, Jill to talk about it, but uh, to talk about these barriers, sorry, but it seems we're having a few technical difficulties that the back end team are sorting. Um, but thank you for going at that, James. And Aaron, if I could bring you in, um, you touched on it before, but cost is one of these big barriers as well, isn't it, when we talk about charging infrastructure? Um, how much of a part of the conversation is that, and what support do government sort of and OZ and those sort of situations have? Um, in supporting this on-street infrastructure? 
Yeah, th thanks, uh, thanks, Matt. So, yeah, co cost is an interesting one because I think I think it is changing quite quite quickly. So today and historically, particularly in the on street sector, and I see in the chat sort of questions about car parks as well. Um, and then car parks is is typically included within the on street sector. I think uh, yeah, James was talking about deployment in uh, in car parks as well. So I think you know that the key aspect is can can residents park there? Is it suitable for residents? That that's certainly part of our criteria. But yes, cost it, it's definitely part of the equation today. Um, particularly where we're sort of deploying slightly ahead of need and partly to to encourage the transition to EVs um, and the the level of um, of of charging demand will be there in the future but it's not necessarily there today across the piece in an on street context so there's there's a role for government funding and support. Um, and we've had a scheme in place for, for a number of years now. So we have the on-street residential charging scheme, which is available to local authorities. Uh, it was £20 million uh, this, this past year. Uh, it's quadrupled in size over the course of, of the last few years in response to demand and in the increasing rollout. But that currently offers up to 75% of the capital costs um, of charge point infrastructure. Increasingly, the 25% the, the um, it has been met in the past from, from local authority budgets. Increasingly, it's being met by the CPOs themselves as demand is starting to increase. I think over time, we can see a higher and higher proportion coming from the private sector uh, as demand for charging uh, increases and the, the commercials start to stack up. But today, that, that's what we have, the on-street residential charging scheme. And as importantly and increasingly perhaps more importantly we have expert support so through the uh, uh, the local government support scheme run by uh, the energy savings trust which the government sponsor there's a lot of support available to local authorities in terms of developing strategies in terms of developing procurement strategies um, and, and support to apply for government funding as well so lots of support so that's that's the picture today i think looking ahead uh, the government has already announced that we'll be introducing a, a larger fund called the Local uh, Energy Infrastructure Fund, the LEVI. Um, that will be launched uh, in due course. It's going to be um, a yeah, much, much larger fund than uh, than we have currently. More details will be um, provided fairly shortly when we publish the infrastructure strategy. Um, so not, not too long before we see that now. Uh, but I think we're seeing what we hope to see through this new scheme is larger scale deployment and more commercially minded deployment that leverages a higher uh, level of uh, of private capital to support bigger schemes in the on street sector because you know the number of evs out on the street is is increasing demand is increasing it's becoming a more pro commercial proposition and the other aspect in terms of the support that we will have uh, more support in terms of guidance and expert support in putting those sort of good commercial contracts in place. We're going to be publishing guidance for local authorities fairly shortly. Uh, we've been working with the IET and Senex to produce um, some guidance, so covering everything from sort of developing strategies uh, to dealing with procurement and commercial arrangements. So that that will be on the way in the not too distant future. And of course, the infrastructure strategy. Uh, that will be published very soon now and that will set out very clear roles and responsibilities to what the government will do what we expect local authorities to do uh, the role of uh, charge point operators etc so more more coming in terms of support definitely and i'm sure that will be eagerly awaited by all those listening today um so thank you very much for sharing that report um and adam if i can also bring you into this as well um you are as one of these charge point operators as aaron alluded to um you do make these efforts to help with the 25 percent and really lighten sort of i don't want to use burden because that sounds like the wrong word but that sort of challenge for local authorities in getting these schemes implemented don't you yeah absolutely and i think aaron's touched on it you know the current funding stream of aux funding um does give us 75 percent and yeah as a charge one operator we're more than willing to top up the 25 percent um i guess just to make it a fully funded model i don't like to use the word free because nothing's free is it you know but fully funded um and i think i'll touch on a little bit later but there's also i guess tools uh, that we use in order to identify areas which we think would get the best utilization out of these on-street charging points 
I think one of the issues that councils face is, you know, what about if I put it in and it doesn't get utilised? You know, so we want to try and, um, I guess, remove that worry from a council's perspective. Um, and then, of course, you know, we're more than willing to help out with, with the, uh, the funding application and process, et cetera. And, you know, I guess offer independent guidance in terms of um, frameworks and public procurement routes, because I think a lot of this is, is quite new to councils. You know, there's a lot of information floating around and flying around. Um, so, you know, I guess from our point of view, we want to make it as easy and as sort of simple and straightforward as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And staying with yourself, obviously, we've talked a lot there about how we help develop and implement the charging. But I guess the uh, the next big thing we talk about is what does it actually look like? And I know I'm seeing in the uh, the live Q&A, which again, thank you to our audience for putting these uh, these questions in. There's quite a lot of interest around sort of existing infrastructure using lamppost charging. And that is the crux of Electricity's uh, solution, isn't it? It absolutely is. You know, like you said, you know, what we do is is quite unique. We take existing lighting columns and we retrofit our charge points into the column. Um, you know, the only thing you can actually see is is the charge point door and the actual socket. So from an aesthetic point of view, you know, which is obviously really important in some regions to, you know, to keep the vision of a city, you know, say like a Bath or a Bristol, you know, it's important that there isn't a lot of street clutter. It doesn't alter what it looks like. Um, and I guess the reason we do this is it's probably threefold, really. You know, it's an existing asset. So there's no need for any additional um, planning permission. You know, it's already there. There's already a power supply there. So, you know, I guess we avoid some of those expensive DNO and connection costs that can be associated with uh, installing a standalone unit. And of course, you know, being an existing asset, there's very, you know, there's not a lot of civil's work that's required to install this. And I suppose to talk about the process and how we do that. So I've already touched on this data analysis and mapping tool that we have. So we're able to look at an area take over 32 data points so things such as existing registrations future potential um, the percentage of people that don't have access to off-street parking etc and then be able to work with councils to identify areas where we think there's going to be high utilization or high potential of utilization either now or in the future so again it removes that barrier of installing something that, that may not get used um, once we've done that, essentially what we're then able to do is just to go and do some site surveys. So understand, you know, other lighting columns fit for purpose, where are they located? Is there sufficient space? Is there sufficient power into it? Um, very easy, quick, you know, free process from our side. Once you identify where we want to install these, installation can take as little as an hour to install one of these charge points into. So if you think about your typical street of, you know, six or seven lighting columns, we can electrify that entire street in you know, half a day to a day which when we're talking about playing catch up and, and roll out of these on street charging points, it's, it's obviously really important that speed and efficiency um, you know, is there from, from a charge point operator. Um, I guess from a user's point of view, you know, once those streets are electrified and they can see visually that there's charge points available, it does start to get that mindset changing. You know, they can see that there's charge points available and I think it starts to get them to think about actually is an EV sufficient, you know, is it suitable for me now that I can see that there's charging infrastructure available as close to my house as possible? You know, so that's really important. Um, I've seen a question in the thing which I'll just cover now. So our charge points, I think one of the things we always see is, well, surely you can't draw much power out of a lighting column. You know, so we can produce between 5.5 and 5.8 kilowatts. So we're only 1.2 kilowatts under that fast threshold. And we're talking about at home charging here so this is not destination or on the go charging and you know that's sufficient to charge a vehicle overnight we're seeing average charge times of between two and three hours you know you look at the average distance traveled in a day between 20 and 30 miles so people are coming home and basically topping their vehicles up in the charge you know access through our light columns and lamp posts um, and it doesn't just have to be from a lighting column you know we can draw power from any source be it a ticket machine or a barrier or whatever that looks like you know, which brings me on to, I guess, my final point. And one of the big things that always comes up is trailing cables. You know, so Adam, we've got loads of lamp posts, but they're all at the back of the pavement, you know, which is an understandable thought process. Uh, and the way that we overcome that is uh, we've got what we call a satellite bollard. So it's a really sort of um, slick standalone satellite bollard. It, you know, if you install it, you'd think it had always been there if you walked past it in the street. It enables us to then basically just a small channel from the light column and bring power to curbside and of course we've got the issue of street clutter and okay what about people with push chairs and wheelchairs what we'll do is we'll make sure there's sufficient space between the lighting column and you know the bollard to make sure that it doesn't interrupt people using uh, the sidewalks and the pathways um, 
So, yeah, I guess from our point of view, I mean, we sort of see this as a really easy, scalable process. You know, it doesn't take long to install. It can be done en masse. And I think that's evident. You know, some of the London boroughs we're working with, I guess, the phases in which they rolled these out, you know, are slowly increasing. So I think they see it as a visual, uh, as a, I guess, a realistic way of getting on street charging out to the masses as quickly as possible. Yeah, absolutely. It's that opportunity to sort of take what's already there and really streamline this EV process for users and for councils. Um, James, you can come back to yourself in uh, Westminster again. I know streamlining sort of the EV process and the installation of charge points was a big part for yourselves as well. Um, I don't know if you want to go into a little bit of how you manage that in Westminster. Well, we very much wanted our system and our rollout to be a resident-led scheme. And we wanted it. Uh, we wanted residents to have the easiest way, opportunity, method of getting in touch with us to actually identify the locations that they wanted to have an EV charger. And so we, we set up a, a system through our website where, where residents could uh, get in touch with us, say, um, this street is fine, we think this lamppost is fine, and then we could pass those details uh, onto Patristi, onto other partners, um, and, and actually have a rollout like that. So we, we were feeding, we, the council acted as like a conduit feeding the, our providers with all this information. Um, and we're, we're at a state now where most people, I think 98% of people who did get in touch with us are now within a three minute walk from their nearest uh, EV charger. And in London, because I'm seeing in the chat about um, the whole conflict over residents um, uh, sharing EV chargers, I think most people who live in urban areas understand that they can't always park outside their front door. Um, and the same approach has to be taken with EVs is that there will be an EV charger near you. Um, it's just not necessarily going to be outside your front door, which why we say the three minute walk um, that we've got at the moment uh, works quite well. And one of the current challenges that we're now starting to have to overcome is how we denote the car parking spaces actually on the ground. Um, and I think what, what we're trying to move towards a system where we can clearly identify car parking spaces in residential areas as EV parking spaces uh, only, whether that's through road markings or whether in the more longer term we look at uh, changing some of the, uh, the structural instruments that we have around parking to be able to enforce uh, against people using ICE cars um, in EV charging bays. Yeah, certainly. And like you say, it's very much an evolving process as, as we go through this as well. Um, Aaron, if we can bring you back in, um, I'm seeing questions come up and it was something I was going to ask you anyway. Um, from the sort of OZEV point of view, um, what are the benefits of on-street charging and sort of this potentially overnight charging compared to relying on rapid charging? And do we need sort of a mix? Sorry, slow to unmute there. Um, yeah, thanks, Matt. So, I mean, yeah, I guess I guess the first thing to say is that, that that there is almost undoubtedly going to be a mix of different charging types, and there isn't a sort of one one size fit in here. It's it's not the same as the sort of of, of the the ice model uh, that we've all got used to over the last. 80 90 years or so it's you know it, it's it's a more uh, yeah it's a more mixed model uh, but on streets clearly has its place within that and it does have some significant benefits so i think you know as adam alluded to earlier it's probably the sort of closest experience to to have off street parking you can charge at home overnight and start every day with a full tank. There's no waiting. There's no not necessarily any sort of visit to uh, to the, the fuel station as such. So that's that's a huge benefit. It's one of the major benefits of, of EVs. So that's number one. That's probably the biggest one. Um, potentially, there, there are uh, benefits in terms of lower impacts to the grid. And I think this is this is something that we we don't fully understand yet. But to the extent that on street charging can help shift charging activity into the off peak so into the sort of you know the wee hours when we have uh, we're producing lots of electricity but don't necessarily have a lot of demand for it uh, it could help minimize the burden on the on the electricity system overall which will save money for, for all of us um, and therefore potentially offer access to the sort of lowest cost charging tariffs to uh, to consumers so that's something that that people can benefit from today 
um, when when they can charge off street um, through through their own charge points. And that's obviously one of the huge attractions of uh, of the sort of the the off street experience. Yeah, certainly. And like you say, it's going to be a, a situation where we assume um, and we plan for a lot of different opportunities, um, isn't it? A lot of different types of charging. Um, Adam, I guess that's the other big benefit of Ubertricity, relying on existing infrastructure as well, is that when we're considering these different mixes, I imagine using existing infrastructure is a little bit cheaper um, and it's a little bit more sort of easier to plan, isn't it? Um, I don't know if you could go in though, as you're certainly more of the expert than I am. Uh, what are some of the actual benefits of that existing infrastructure for the users and for the local authorities? Yeah, of course. And I think Aaron's obviously touched on a few of them, you know, um, in terms of that network demand. So I think one of the big things is, you know, I guess from a commercial point of view and also uh, an installation point of view, there isn't a need, you know, for big DNA costs or grid upgrades when it comes to using existing street columns. You know, it just isn't there. Um, and I think we've seen conversation with councils, there's some eye watering costs when it comes to upgrading grids and trying to put in charges or standalone units. Um, obviously the civils, you know, there's no need for, for major civils works when it comes to installing in there. Um, and then I guess just the speed really in which it can be done. I've already touched on it, you know, as little as an hour to install a charge point is, you know, it's pretty remarkable. And I guess with that sort of speed and scale, it enables us to cover a, a bigger area, you know, um, I think we've also touched on the fact that parking is an issue. And I think one of the ways you can get around that is just to electrify more of a street or more of an area. You know, I know Westminster have done a really good job of that. Um, and then I suppose from a user's point of view, because it is important that we understand the user process, we want to make this as easy as possible. You know, as Aaron said, get as close to that at home experience as we can. And from a, an Ubertricity point of view, I mean, there's two real ways of doing it. I mean, you can use the Shell Recharge app if you want to, really easy and efficient. Um, but from our point of view, what we want to make it is, you know, um, you can turn up to any charge point and go through the same process. So every charge point has a QR code on it. User can scan that, input their details and the charge process starts. It really is as simple as that, you know, so it doesn't really matter. You don't have to be plugged into a specific charge point, you know, for it to, for it to work. You can park wherever you want as long as there's a charge point in proximity and start that charge, you know. So from our point of view, really scalable, cheap, efficient, and, you know, the user experience is there as well. Yeah, certainly. And I guess, and you did mention there, uh, Adam, the idea that in Westminster are already seeing great success with it. Um, James, I guess those efforts also go a long way to sort of encouraging residents to change their behaviours or their perceptions on EV car ownership. If it's working, more like we're more likely to uh, see an uptick, aren't we? Absolutely. And I think when it comes to uh, changing behaviour, there, there's very much, in London at least, a carrot and stick approach. We're seeing the stick um, in terms of what we're seeing with the ULES. Um, we're going to see a, a more of a rollout with zero emission zones. But we need that carrot. We need that infrastructure, which allows people to, to change their behaviour. And, and one of the big things that we're trying to change is the actual once people own an EV, they realise that they don't have to have it on charge every night. It's uh, they can trickle charge it once, uh, sometimes once every two weeks. Uh, and the rate that um, uh, car battery technology is changing, it means that we can have a system whereby, again, people don't need to have a EV charging spot outside their house. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I want to now sort of bring in, because we've got quite a few really good questions come in. I want to bring some of that audience Q&A in. Um, so I will direct it to who I think is the most relevant person among our guests. But if you want to add in, by all means, just let me know. Um, we will go to yourself, Adam, first, though, for a simple one that you may know the answer or not. Um, but Graham has asked uh, how wide, I'm assuming this is when you mentioned the sort of um, standalone bollards that can be placed in, how wide paths need to be? Because in their particular instance, they have quite narrow paths. Is this something that is flexible or is there sort of minimum requirements? Do you know yeah, so? yeah. So I mean, I'm not sure in terms of the, I guess, the national minimum requirements, but I mean, we leave 2.2 meters between ours, you know, which is, is more than sufficient. Um, I, I think it's not a case of, you know, the the light column will be directly in line with where the bollard goes. We offset it at an angle to allow that accessibility, you know, because it is important that you know we don't penalise pedestrians, you know, when trying to roll out EV infrastructure, you know, and I think the the I guess the solution that we think is most efficient is just to stick a satellite bollard that you know isn't an eyesore in there to enable this solution to 
you know, be scalable for people that have columns at the back of the path. Yeah, so I thank you for that. Um, and one of the other um, big questions that came in earlier, um, which Aaron, I wonder if you'd be willing to take this, uh, was from Mark, who was uh, asking sort of if you had any advice for a situation they're seeing, which in a more rural county, uh, they're struggling to potentially see commercial partners see uh, EV as viable in those areas. Um, is that something that always ever also looking at how we make sure that there's EV adoption or strategies to EV adoption in different areas with different circumstances? Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm responsible for, I mean, in terms of sort of vehicle, the plug-in car grants and, and in the future, a, a, a ZEV mandate, um, so that, you know, the, the vehicles are coming, there, there is no question about that. In terms of infrastructure support, we certainly recognise that the sort of the, the commercial case for infrastructure deployment will will vary from location to location so areas with with lower charging demand but some large some charging demand will, will have a more challenging commercial case and that that's why we have that capital funding available so the, the on-street residential charging scheme today uh, the levi tomorrow and one of the aspects that we're looking at with with the new scheme is is greater flexibility in terms of the technologies that the charge that that we will um, be willing to support through through that capital funding. So I think I think we have we have support uh, both in terms of guidance and in terms of uh, capital support, and that that will be growing over the next four years. Yeah, Matt, can I just I guess just touch on that as well? You yeah. know, because we're seeing a a big I guess issue with urban versus rural split. You know, and the the likelihood that rural gets left behind when it comes to charging infrastructure. You know, we've had a conversation recently with a pretty rural rural um, council and you know everyone they've spoken to apparently there just isn't that commercial model there you know, they don't see the demand at the moment but it's important that we are proactive with this you know I think there's a, a more of a reliance if you're in a rural area on the motor vehicle you know there's not always um, those options in terms of public transport or being able to walk or cycle to where you need to get to so it is important these rural areas don't get left behind you know um, it's you know like i said it's just it's just something that we need to be considerate of you know it can't just be about a commercial model from a i guess a, a cpo's point of view you know it needs to be inclusive it needs to be thought through we need to be future proof in these networks in both urban and rural areas definitely I, like you say it's one of i think the crux of everything that local authorities and that do that the end user the residents have to be considered in it don't they um there's also a question in um potentially around sort of considering to the other side of it, we've talked quite a bit about overnight and on street parking around potentially needing sort of super uh, rapid charger access for certain areas. I wonder, James, um, was that ever a consideration in Westminster? Because like you said, you have a lot of tourists and sort of short stay people. Absolutely, but the, the key with that is location um, because the rapid chargers do produce quite a bit of noise. Um, and uh, I, I would warn any local authority about putting rapid chargers in uh, residential areas um, or, or very close to residential properties um, because a lot of the negative feedback that we've had is about the noise that these chargers create, especially when you've got lots of taxis, which are now electric, wanting to charge them at one, two, three o'clock in the morning. And where they have been put near residential areas, that does cause um, uh, quite a bit of upset from, from residents. Yeah, perfect. And if I could stay with you as well, because I think this is also a question from Christopher that might be useful um, for you to answer. Um, how do you control occupancy of charging points in resident park and controlled streets? You mentioned earlier that people in urban areas are starting to accept they don't necessarily always get to park outside their house. But I imagine it does become a bit of a challenge, particularly for those parking non-EV vehicles in potentially EV spots. Yeah, and I, I think this is where we're having to start to take a think outside the box approach. Um, and I think a lot of it goes to do with communication with residents. Um, we've got to be uh, aware that res most residents will want to do the right thing. And which is why before we start to move down the enforcement route, making it much clearer denotion on the pavements and on the, on the street that these are EV charging bays um, and try that before we then move to the EV only bays where we can start enforcing that in terms of our planning uh, rules, uh, sorry, our parking rules and regulations. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and just looking through, and again, to our audience, thank you. There are so many questions coming through. We'll try to get as to as many of them as we can, and those that we can't, I'm sure we'll be able to pass on to the, uh, the delegates today um, afterwards. Um, 
Adam, there's a question from Sarah that's come in that I think would be quite interesting to get your perspective on, which um, she's saying that one of the challenges that they have in their area is that they have a bit of a chicken egg situation. Charging companies want to know where the power source is coming from and the power companies want to know what charge is being used. Um, she's asked how they manage it. How does Ubertristy manage that? Is it about being very flexible? Yeah, it is. Um, and I guess I guess from a power supply point of view, you know, obviously we'll go and do the site surveys, et cetera, to make sure it's fit for purpose. Um, I guess one of the little niches is because we sort of fall underneath that fast charging, um, I guess, threshold when it comes to working with DNOs, you know, it isn't something that we have to, I guess, pre-inform them of. You know, we obviously like to work in unison with them, but because we fall underneath that seven kilowatt, we can actually install and then they let them know post-installation of these um, obviously lamp columns are unmetered supplies you know so we have an independent third party organization that assesses you know what sort of energy is being drawn out of it so it doesn't affect councils in that way um, but yeah I guess from an ubertricity standalone point of view you know it's it's really easy and, and simple you know we work with these DNO companies and like I said insulation go ahead and, and we can inform them afterwards um, but you know there's loads of nuances across the UK isn't there in terms of what power supply is available to some lighting columns some are on, you know, sort of standalone circuits, if you will, you know, and we sort of see, I guess, more historic um, power supplies in, in more rural areas. So, of course, that raises another challenge. Um, but, you know, we've had a, a massive expansion of our network. So, there's, you know, always going to be issues and problems that come up. But, you know, we haven't sort of faced one which we can't get around to date, fingers crossed. Amazing. And long may that continue, we hope. Um... Before I throw the next question, which Aaron will be to you, um, I saw something come up in the live Q&A there asking about whether this session will be recorded. There will be an opportunity to also watch this on demand post event. So don't worry if you're on desperately scribbling notes, like I'm, many, I'm sure many of our delegates are, there will also be opportunities to listen back. Um, Aaron, for yourself, um, you touched on uh, some of the plans that are coming up with future funding and OZEV, and I'm aware that obviously a lot of that you won't be able to talk about at the moment. Um, but there were some questions that come in that as to whether some of those grants and opportunities will potentially also keep in mind community owned or managed EV spaces and whether there will also be um, support for those in the devolved administrations. Are those either of things you can talk about at the moment? Uh, so so we, we are uh, thinking about the sort of the, the community charging models and how we might be able to support those uh, in terms of support for the devolved administration. So, so currently, the, the AUK scheme uh, is used across uh, across the nation, so it is uh, it is um, yeah it's available to all of the devolved authorities. Um, I think going ahead, the the uh, funding for the the new schemes are for the new scheme is for England only, um, and funding was provided through um, the Barnet formula, which is Treasury's way of sort of divvying up. Uh, cash to uh, across uh, the devolved nations where it is a devolved issue and transport is a devolved matter. So that's the sort of rationale for that. Uh, but we we do talk to the devolved authorities um, on a on a regular basis to make sure we're sort of joined up in our policies and we can learn from each other. Brilliant. Um, that's great for that. Um, I've got one more Q and A question that I'll take for now. As I say, any of those questions that have not been answered, I'm sure we'll be able to get to the relevant people at post event. Um, Adam, it comes back to yourself, and it links to some of what we've talked about already, uh, but it's around the Ubertricity L app and whether that alerts owners to when a vehicle is fully charged. Um, I'm guessing the also benefit there that one that can prevent people parking in spaces for longer than they need, but needs the consideration that we don't want to text at three in the morning, I'm guessing. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Um, so like I said, there's a couple of ways in which the user can access this. So through the Shell Recharge app, which of course will show you the status of your charge, etc. Um, or as a sort of pay-as-you-go um, Ubertricity route, if you will, you know, you'll you'll get a, an alert or an email, I guess, not only if, you know, it won't sort of send you when the, when the session's fully charged, but if there's an incident, you know, so if um, I don't know, the cable's not plugged in properly or the cable gets removed or the charging session stopped for whatever reason, it will alert you to that as well. You know, because I think that's the thing, you know, you're not necessarily having on your driveway. It might be, you know, three or four doors down. You want the confidence that if you plug it in, you know, you get there in the morning, it's going to be fully charged. Um, so, yeah, there's a there's a couple of routes and we're starting to see more of the adoption of the Shell Recharge app as opposed to the page go just because it's, you know, it's simple. You don't have to input your details every time. Um, but, yeah, there's obviously feedback uh, via the app for the charging sessions. 
Yeah, definitely. It, it's very much the same that you to, uh, experience it in mind, isn't it? Um, and just before we close, I want to offer two final questions of my own to the, uh, of the panel. Um, first is sort of a very quick, um, I'll give a minute each of you sort of, um, but we'll start with yourself, Aaron, uh, to sort of talk a little bit about where you see the next few years looking for EV. I realize I've said a minute, it might not be that you can fit that in a minute, so don't worry. Yeah, thanks. So uh, I guess well, I'll touch on three points. I'm sure there, there, there could be many more, but I'll, I'll do three. So acceleration of deployment, number one, that there's undoubtedly going to be a huge acceleration of deployment in charging infrastructure, both on street and, and rapid, uh, just, just across the piece, really. So today we have nearly 30,000 public chance points in the UK, servicing over 750,000 electric vehicles. Um, that, that is undoubtedly going to expand to so both the vehicles and the infrastructure. We've seen EV growth rates have just accelerated massively over the course of the past year. It was 12% for all of 2021, but it was 25% in, in December last year. So as, as the EVs come, the, the demand for chargers will come as well, and it will increase the commercials. Uh, and that leads quite neatly into the, to the second point. So the commercialization of EV infrastructure will gather pace. So we're already seeing it in the sort of home charge market. It's a pretty commercial place now. Uh, and that's one reason that we will no longer be um, offering grants for charge points for those with off street uh, parking, they, they finish in April, that 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 market is largely commercialized. Um, we're already seeing the, the, the rapid and the destination market um, it is pretty commercial already. There are there are some sort of difficult areas. So the strategic road network being being one of them. Um, but increasingly, we'll see more commercialization there. And I very much expect the on street market to, to follow suit. Currently, it's heavily supported, but I expect to you know, firmly expect to see a higher proportion or a lower proportion of, of public subsidy um, over time over the next four years. I think Adam talked earlier about fully, um, fully funded models. I expect that to grow. Um, and I expect our, our grant system will, will become more flexible to, to the needs of the market. Um, and the third thing, innovation is going to continue in this space. That, that there's a huge amount um, already. I saw somebody reference sort of solar in the chat. So that's, that's one potential area uh, that can help potentially re reduce DNO costs. Um, the neighborly disputes were, was another thing that was coming up in the chat, whether the, some of the apps can help start to address some of that sort of booking charge points and so forth. Uh, greater variability on tariffs, uh, potentially sort of having smart public charges where you can get a lower tariff overnight. Uh, community charging was referenced earlier and uh, the size of vehicle batteries changing. So yeah, innovation is going to continue at a pace. I think there's a, yeah, th those are my three top tips for development. Absolutely. And I think if they all come off, we're in a very, very good place, aren't we? Um, James, for yourself, um, what does sort of the next few years look um, for Westminster? What's the goal? Uh, well, we want to continue expanding um, as much as we can, because one of the, uh, the challenges we're going to have, and I think Aaron touched this briefly, is what happens when we tip over the scales into most people owning an EV. Um, and this part of the reason why we really wanted to get ahead of the curve because we, when that uh, change happens, and we can see it now with the, the ownership of EVs just going through the roof, uh, and that is a mixture of the supply chain issues, uh, fuel price uh, increases, um, impact the ULEZ in London, we're, we're just seeing the numbers go up and up and up and up. And we really have gone a long way to make sure that we're ready for when the, what we call it, the explosion actually does happen. Um, but I think my top tips would be residents, residents, residents. They have to be front and center of any expansion plan, any rollout, um, because if you engage residents early on, then you're going to avoid those disputes. You're going to dispel some of the myths. You're going to uh, have a system which has got resident buy-in. So that, that would be my key piece of advice. Yeah, absolutely. And like you say, that resonates with so much we've heard today. Um, Adam, I want to then give you the final word for the day to similarly, as I've asked the other panelists, um, what do you see the future being and where does Ubertricity fit into that? Yeah, I've got to follow those two. Um, yeah, so I guess from a, from a, an on-street point of view, I mean, Ubertricity have got a target of 25,000 on-street charge points by you know 2025. So it's, um, sorry, 50,000 by 2025. So, so it's a real big push from us. Um, 
I think I read in the, the Competition and Market Authority, actually only a thousand charge points outside of London are on street at the moment. You know, so there's a, there's a big opportunity and a big gap. And I think James touched on it, you know, working alongside the residents to make it as easy and as efficient as possible to be able to own an electric vehicle. When you don't have access to off street charging. It's really important from a council's point of view. Um, and I think we're going to start to see, hopefully, you know, education, or, you know, for local authorities around, you know, that fast isn't always better. You know, there is a place and a need for a portfolio of different charging um, infrastructure across the UK. And I th hopefully we'll start to see, you know, on street pickup pace. And I guess the, the residents being afforded the luxury of, of having accessible, and easy to use charging infrastructure that's as close as possible to where they live. Amazing. Um, and I think that we've covered absolutely everything that we could ever want to cover really around EV for where it is today. Um, but I know from myself, um, I found it absolutely fascinating. It does seem that our audience has as well by the number of questions coming in. The live chat's been a buzz throughout, as we've heard. Um, and similarly, any of those questions that have not been asked, as I've said throughout, we will make sure that we find a way to get those back out to the panelists um, so that we can continue this learning. This is very much a first step in the continued path. Um, it seems that, um, as I say as well, there was questions come in around whether we can watch this back. Absolutely. All of our webinars are on demand. So as well as all of the diligent notes taken, usually within the next 48 hours, it's often a lot sooner. There'll also be an opportunity to watch back today's uh, talks. From myself, though, um, and from all of our panellists, thank you so much. Thank you to Aaron, to James, to Adam, and to Jill, who sadly, while she couldn't make it with us technically, was also very important behind the scenes. It's been an absolute pleasure. Hope you all enjoy the rest of your day.